Okay. Let's go. Um, <clears throat> in the incredible, incredible, wonderful scene uh, in, the, in the movie. You have to speak up again. Yeah. Uh, in the in the uh, wonderful scene at the public at uh, the police station. Right. Uh, we uh, we feel uh, very uh, deep the the the, the distance uh, between uh, some different uh, a, a phantom he, he didn't get and right. other phantoms and there is no really there is incredible the, the no relationship no no relation no no uh, no one looks uh, at uh, at the other. In generally speaking, and it is very strange the relation with the, the scene at the cinema right. uh, during before the the, right. the ending, uh, where uh, on the contrary he is able to have something like a relationship with cinema, and uh, uh, as it appears that in the scene at the police station, we we are. In front of something like cinema, where we are, we right. don't touch, we don't have. Uh, it's really a, a question of, of different uh, phantom people, phantom in different ages, in one sense. And it's strange that the the warmer, warmer relationship is on the contrary at the cinema. Uh, one one scene appears to me to 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 to, to show us what is cinema in the police station. At the cinema is something else, is like cinema um, uh, engendering uh, another kind of, uh, of life, just before that, uh, right. anyway. I, I wonder if uh, uh, this scene, the, 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 the scene of the police station, is not for you, in one sense, the cinema or your cinema. Well, no, it, it, for me, the the police, the police station, like all great, you know, like all ideas, it started with something real. He really did walk through the detective bureau about a week before, didn't happen the same night, about the week before he uh, went to the biograph and got killed. For me, the scene is about, here's what your life has been. Here's your past. It's your whole life. This is, there used to be a television show in America called This Is Your Life. Well, this was your life. This is just what your life has been. And everybody's gone. So he's like the last person on some uh, pre you know, prehistoric beach. And everything else is everybody, everybody else. Billy's gone, Red's gone, this one's gone, this one's dead. Babyface Nelson's dead, everybody's dead. And, um, and, and these are uh, the events that you've made happen. This man got robbed, these people got killed, whatever it is, for better or for worse. This is, so this is what your life has been. So it's almost like here's your past all displayed for you. And when he goes into the cinema, for me, it, it, becomes, it becomes the most important existential question. You know, what should my death be? It's, it, it, it's, it's, so the cinema biograph becomes, here's your immediate future. And we know how immediate it is, because we know there's 13 men outside who are there to kill him. He doesn't know that. But Clark Gable, this is so bizarre, you know. Uh, Clark Gable, his character is based slightly on Dillinger. And a lot of what he, a lot of actors at that time, in 1933, 1934, because Dillinger was so popular. So he showed up in, you know, pieces of him showed up in different characters in all kinds of movies. They were coming out of Hollywood. They were inspired by Dillinger. So there's something about Blackie, the Clark Gable character, inspired by Dillinger. So here's Dillinger's, uh, there's a talk about phantoms. Here's an incarnation of Dillinger talking to him. And he's saying, and, and confronted with the same fundamental questions. So I spend the rest of my life in jail, which Dillinger could have put his hands up and surrender and do, you know, or I should, should I go out the way I live and just be electrocuted? And he says, you know, you know, you know, uh, die the way you live. All of a sudden, living any other way doesn't mean a thing. Now that's move the movie the real John Dillinger saw that night. You know, when he walks out. And, I, and, and so for me, how I was using it was, was to try and, 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 and imagine what Dillinger's thinking. And it becomes the answer to the question that will confront him 
in the near future of two, three, four, five minutes from now when he, when he walks outside the door. So I wanted to know what his mindset was before he reached the sidewalk. Well, so I'm using, I use Manhattan melodrama as, as future vision, if you like, a projection of the fu very short future, future vision. And that's what was in my mind. In one sense, it's like uh, the, the, the movie, the scene of the movie is, is his afterlife. Is is confronted with that. You mean after after, after, life. after life? Yeah. The, the cinema, for, uh, the movies. Well, it's it, it's it's I don't know about afterlife. <laughs> I know about I <laughs> do knows? know about I <laughs> do knows? know about after the after the movie says the end, and you're going to go out to that sidewalk. You uh, you know what 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 do I want his attitude to be? And this is a man which gets back to the orig origins of the character and why I was so interested in this man, because one of the reasons was he was, he was, he had this, uh, this forcefulness of uh, embracing life and no matter what tragedy befell him, he never stopped. He never stopped. He never stopped moving forward and progressing. So it was indefatigable. He loses Billy, he loses Red. No matter what happens, he just keeps Keeps on, uh, he's in, keeps on going, and uh, he doesn't get depressed. He doesn't get sad. He doesn't run away. He doesn't commit suicide. Frank Nitti, the organized crime figure in 1943, got depressed and committed suicide. Dillinger doesn't commit suicide. So, and and, and um, you know, so that's the origins of the character, and now he hears the message from Clark Gable, you know. So the key question for me as a filmmaker is he walks out of the cinema, he walks on the sidewalk, things are starting to be strange, what's he thinking? What's his attitude? You know, is it desperation? Is it aggression? You know, that's what I, that's what I, wanted, to, that's what I wanted to know. And, uh, and I decided that he wanted to meet his fated end. Alvin Karpis, had a very, made a very different decision and spent 33 years in Alcatraz. He surrendered in New Orleans in 1936. Anyway. Um, speaking, you, you said that uh, the scene at the police station... You have to speak up, my friend. <coughs> yeah. You said that uh, the scene at the police station is uh, uh, Dillinger in front of, your li of his life. I mean, right, what his life had been, his past. Okay, yeah. the past. But uh, in front of, uh, of, of his life, his past life, is like a ghost in that moment. He's like a phantom. And uh, that reminds me right. uh, why? Because he, he, he can do nothing. He just, uh, he, he's in front of his uh, uh, friends uh, that are dead in his history, but uh, he, he's not like material. He well, could he, be. Uh, it, might not, it, may, it may be seen that way. Because all the other cops are listening to the baseball game, yeah. okay. But but my my intent is that he's just doing something audacious. Uh, the audacity of it is to walk through that police station, which he did, and and uh, and uh, the the dare, the challenge of it. It's almost medieval when you read about uh, you know how men at arms confronted themselves in battle. It's almost medieval, and and um, uh, so I, I didn't intend for you to feel that he's a ghost. He's not a ghost. He's really there, and they're really. And I mean, if you said to those detectives, "What's the chances of John Dillinger coming in here?" This old John Dillinger never going to walk in here. It's so outrageous for them to even think that. You know, they could they could look right at him. Look at that guy walk through here. He looks just like John Dillinger. Yeah, that's fun. You know, it would never occur to them that John Dillinger would walk through, and that's exactly the kind of thing that Dillinger did. I mean, you didn't have to jump over, um, uh, you know, he was famous for jumping over, you know, he'd rob a bank and the tellers, the tellers cages were there. He used to jump over the top. You, to, you can walk around, why jump, <laughs> you jump over, you know? And, um, and, um, and not because he was a fool. He wasn't the fool. Bonnie and Clyde were fools. They were small time petty thieves. John Dillinger was no fool, you know. So it, it, um, all right, sorry, I, I, I yeah, digress. But uh, <laughs> what, what, you want to 
Did you want to no, finish? No, no, yeah, but the, 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 the question is because it's my, uh, my opinion is that in your film, not just public enemies, but also in the others, uh, uh, the, in, the insider or uh, right. Miami Vice, uh, um, there is uh, uh, like a, f a, s a ghost story, the characters that are epic, they are heroes. In, in some way, you re. But they're people. Yes, they're, they're people. They're people, okay. but they're going through very intense experiences. And when you okay, go through a very it. intense experience, it does get dreamlike. And what's interesting to me is if you could be inside the experience of the person, what they're feeling, what they're thinking. So when Russell Crowe is suicidal and insider, okay, or when, or when, uh, you know, I'm uh, sure some moments in Ali, they're not coming to me right now, but, but you know, that, that experience, what, what, uh, uh, even Miami Vice, when Crockett falls in love with Gong Lee and, that, and they're in Cuba together. I mean, how surreal can that get? This, uh, the answer is as surreal as I can make it. And, um, and so, too, with, with, with Dillinger. To me, I, I, that's where I would like to go with, 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 uh, you know, with cinema, with, with experiencing another life, you know. And it's, it's uh, uh, you know, it's to, be locate, to be able to locate audience, locate people inside the shoes of Dillinger, inside his skin, looking through his eyes. How I know how that guy's feeling. I love that when it happens to me, when I don't need words or dialogue to tell me, when I, when I look or a gesture, and I know what that character's thinking. And, and, and uh, somebody comes up to him, and I know what his response is going to be because I haven't come to know him. So that's, that's what's so, what's so interesting. Um, the complexity of Johnny Depp's reaction to Red's death is marvelous. You know, if you've seen it as many times as I've seen it, which is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, you know, the complexity of it is, is it's not predictable. It's not, let's act sad because my friend died. That's not what he's doing. I mean, he's truly experiencing the death of somebody close to him. And when he loses Billy, he's truly experiencing somebody being taken from him or the threat of somebody taken from him. That's devastating, you know. And that's, that's, you know, that's the, uh, that's when it gets great being a director and working with an actor like that. I want to say about uh, your, uh, the characters uh, of uh, your cinema, no? Uh, James Gunn in uh, The, the Thief, uh, or uh, the police agent, uh, agent uh, in uh, Manhunter. In uh, right. They are uh, searching uh, a new life. A new life. They think about a new life uh, after. But uh, Dillinger, uh, maybe with the, the character of uh, Tom Cruise in uh, Collateral, uh, from uh, in all uh, in all the film, right. speak uh, about. You say that he go go on go on every time. No, he speak uh, to go on, uh, but he, he speaks about uh, the nothing, the never, uh, uh, the empty. No. This is not. Who does? Which character? Dillinger. Which character thinks about nothing? Dillinger. Uh, Dillinger. Dillinger. Right. It's exactly. He's, he's, exactly uh, why. That's exactly the mystery. Yes. That, 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 uh, he's that I more. Uh, in production. Yeah. He know. Uh, seem that yeah. he know uh, very well that uh, he's going to die. Right. That. that uh, but at the same time, it, he go on, go on uh, on his way, you know. Uh, but. Uh, he has consciousness. He has consciousness of the of the of the dead, and they speak a lot about the nothing, the right. nothingness. The, the nothingness, no? Or yes, I mean, I don't know if this is where, where your question go, is, is going to, but uh, it was precisely because Dillinger didn't have a concept of the future. It's not like he said, I'm not worried about the future, everything will be fine. He had no idea for future. He didn't ask himself the question about the future. So, you know, it's, it's a word in English, you know, ideation. He had no ideation of a future. And why? What, what in his experience, produced somebody, and it's not because he was stupid or that he didn't plan. He planned, they planned robberies in fantastic planning. They didn't plan a week from Thursday. It didn't occur to them to, to plan what's next or where to, where to go with this. And um, uh, everybody, it did to many other banks, very successful bank robbers that period, people whose names that you may not know, like Harvey Bailey and Herbert K. Lennon, they planned ahead. 
One guy bought uh, 15 gas stations and took up playing golf, you know, then he lost everything in the depression, in the bank crash of 29, went back to robbing banks. But not Dillinger. He's just living for this, to be in the stream of, uh, of women and the sensual world of sensory matter, the material world of, uh, of, of good times and women and clothes and, and uh, just, you know, feeling great. And that's what he wanted, you know. Um, Looking for love, really looking for love, um, uh, from his childhood, from when he was three, and he lost his mother, um, and he he. Uh, so that's, you know, what what uh, is precisely that that, was, that mystified me, and I could, couldn't couldn't figure that out. It took a long time to figure out what was going on inside, what I think what was going on. Um, you know, and and the the visions of men like Frank and Thief um, uh, came from uh, speculation about what happens when in your formative years as a man from, say, when you're 17 or 18 to when you're 30, you're, you're, ju you're, you're put in, in a prison. So you never, when you get out, you don't know how to work touch tone telephones. You don't know how to ask a girl out. You don't know what music, you don't know anything. So it's like you were taken into outer space and brought back. So it's almost like a, the wild child kind of, you know, subgenre of movies. And and where do you get ideas about what you want what you want your life to be like? Because that's what you think about in prison. We well, read magazines. So I want this house. So what's very important was that collage he had about here's what I want this kind of a house when I get out. Then he sees a bed house. No, I don't want this house. I want that house. I have this car. I want to have a wife. I want to have a kid. I want my life. You know, I want to pass along my DNA. Okay, so he's thinking about these things. It's in it. In what struck me is that it should be a crude, and and uh, obtuse vision of life. It should make us. It should feel very mechanical and artificial to us because it was made by somebody who's living on the, the planet Vega or something. So that that was the that was what struck me. I got that idea from being close to people in Folsom Prison in 1979, and I saw how they were living their lives. And there is no philosophical question that is not active, active parts of conversations of men in prison. The most seemingly esoteric, profound, it's everyday dialogue with these guys. and, and um, and some of the people I met, most of whom were autodidactic. They had educated themselves. And, uh, um, and so I saw that. So that's where the idea came from. And I embellished it and brought it into, into Thief. I asked one guy in prison, I asked him in Jericho Mile, I said, uh, I wanted to cast him. And, uh, you know, and he was a, uh, you know, African-American, big guy, all kinds of tattoos part of a prison gang called Black Guerrilla Family. It, one of the, there was three big gangs in Folsom, the Black Gang, uh, uh, MA and Mexican Mafia is another gang. And the Aryan Brotherhood, white gang, hadn't, wasn't invented yet, so it was mostly Hell's Angels. Because Sonny Barger, the head of Hell's Angels, was in Folsom, as was Charlie Manson. And I said to this African-American guy, I said, I'd like to cast you in the film. He said, I'm not gonna be in your film. And I said, really, why? And he said, because if I allowed myself to be in your film, I would be allowing you to appropriate the surplus value of my bad karma. Okay? This guy had read Marx and Engels. He knew, he took surplus value as related to labor and applied it to his bad luck. He became a Buddhist. I mean, he was fabulously well read, you know, and, and he was serious. He wasn't just, you know, so that's what you encountered. So that, is, that informed some of these characters, whether it was Dillinger or Frank or, or Neil McCauley, who really existed. Um, that's where some of these ideas came from. So it's yes, yes. Uh, in uh, the, the, the character, the character of uh, Dillinger, or Dep Deplinger, <laughs> it seems to me uh, to be um, living in a, in a sort of absolute pre present. Uh, Absolute. Present, right. the present. 
And in the same uh, in the same time, he is in 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 other times. He needs uh, to recognize himself, uh, his desire in uh, uh, advertising in, in some in someone in someone else, in some people, some woman he he desires. So um, in in this movie, I find uh, something like the not the opposite, but the same thing, um, the reverse of uh, Miami Vice, uh, the movie. Um, something like uh, 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 a character who jumps uh, in uh, in a void and happens to be only in one sense only cinema, and in the same uh, exactly in the same time he is uh, uh, a real per, a real right. character in one sense, and um, um, it seemed to me it seems to me that uh, um, is the first uh, your first movie where is so. Classical, the 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 the, the, the impact of the char character is the impact of the of the character and of yeah. the story itself. Right. Uh, for instance, in uh, uh, in Ali, Ali, uh, the the Muhammad Ali is always seen uh, through uh, some eyes. Uh, I don't know if it's TV, if it's, uh, if it's the legend, but uh, you. It's difficult to intercept the. It's like he he was intercepted by some uh, different eyes, not our eyes. Right. And we are confronted with a very dispersed vision. Here, he's really and in Miami Vice, all the vision is something like, I don't see, I don't say digital, but it's something like, a, 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 like a, a spectacular life, a very uh, ghost-like in one sense. Here he's. Uh, you know, I, I feel what uh, Donatello say, uh, was saying about uh, the phantom, the ghost, but in the same time is is the most real, I think, of your characters, uh, yeah, thank you. Dillinger. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it felt like it felt like taking a character and 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 and, and projecting him into the void. Yeah. You know, in in that in that uh, in the void of. Of, of existence, you know, when when anything can happen and you're not conscious and you become, uh, sometimes you, then suddenly you, you snap into consciousness, not that Dillinger does, except that at, at the end. Um, if, I, if I take what you mean, you know, accurately, um, but it, it, it felt, in, May, in doing it, it felt like we were, uh, you know, I was trying to be inside his innermost experiences. What does he think at this very moment? Really as if you're there, we are him, I'm him, Johnny's him. From my point of view, it has to be me initially, and then, uh, you know, what is he thinking? You know, what does it mean? What is he feeling? What is he experiencing as a real human being? Not as a character in fiction, but as a real human being. Uh, and and very often in his in his life the void was presented. I mean, how did they view this this assault on their bodies, being wounded, being shot? They didn't think about it the way the way we do. Um, it it was it was um, it's almost as almost almost like cartoon characters. They're shot. They're going to get infected, and they're going to die, or they're not. If they're not, they're going to get better. And if they can manage the pain with some morphine, they do. If they can't, they don't. Uh, he had horrendous, I didn't deal with it, plastic surgery at one point. And I was in pain for, horrible pain for, for like a week. And, and then sober. Um, but let me go back to what you were saying about, is that what you meant in terms of leaping off into the void? Yes, not in yeah. one sense. Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I feel uh, in uh, w what I felt. I think yes. Yeah. I, I, I can. No one. The last curiosity, but I don't know. It was about this, uh, the the fact that he, he, he is strange uh, watching the movie. That the beginning, uh, the the evasion, the first, uh, uh, f from when he he goes to to the jail to to get right. the people out of jail, and when is going to be shot uh, on the sidewalk he is we, we feel that he is not uh, not only not now but is a moment where uh, people doesn't know him 
so even his most uh, important enemy doesn't, is not sure about his identity in this moment. Um, and this is very strong in the movie, the fact that there is no, there is his image and his character and his real thought. And in one sense, we are confronted with the fact that he has no real mirror, just in, at the, just in the, 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 the cinema, the movie theater. But when he's out of the cinema, he's not recognized. It's very difficult to recognize him. Right. He has to be, to be, he needs a traitor to, to be, to, to identify. Be, to be, yes. This is, no, yeah. That's very fascinating in the movie. I feel yeah. it's so strong. Also, at the beginning, we, he's, uh, uh, he's a policeman. No, he's a dating yeah. he's, 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 he's the same thing. He's not known in one sense. No, he's not recognized. He's, uh, I, I feel it's, it's a very strong thing in the movie, this. Well. Thank you. <laughs> the, 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 and I appreciate the thoughts. You, you know, your thoughts are very deep, and I appreciate them very much. They're, they're, um, um, yes, the, the end of the movie has a lot of complexity to it. He's, he, he has changed. The, 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 the people, what the people think of him has changed. Um, What's he's thinking? I ask myself, what's he thinking exactly when he's walking down this? It's 88 feet from when he walks out of the theater to when he falls on the ground. What's going on in that 88 feet? In Chicago, it's the most examined 88 feet in the city. Uh, retired homicide detectives would show up on our set and they lay out, roll out this long piece of paper and say every single thing that's happening to everybody around in these, in, these, in these moments of that, of that walk, where this guy was, where that guy was. So it's like, it's like reality under a microscope, you know. It, it, it's, you know, so it, it, became, so it became very complex um, and detailed. And then, you know, I had to pull, apart, pull that apart and just take the components that made what I want you to uh, track with, which is with, which is what he's, what he's seeing, and there's a very important part of that, and that's Purvis, Purvis's, fumbles his gun. You know, and 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 so, hopefully, everybody's characters that are coming together in this, you know, this this fusion of that moment and those 88 feet, um, everything seems to manifest. And that's very strange. Uh, his life rolls before him in the police station, and Clark Gable tells him about his near future. Uh, Purvis, if it works, is a man in, in with internal contradictions. So we know he's good with a gun. We know from, from when he kills Babyface yeah. Nelson. And yet, at this moment in time, the, it's almost like the internal contradictions within him manifest himself. There's these crowds of people. He's a southern aristocrat. It's impolite to push a woman out of the way. So he gets fumbled up. And after the whole movie, he doesn't shoot John Dillinger. It's the man from the West. It's the ex-Texas Ranger who, who, who is just linear, you know. And he's the one who puts the bullet in his head is the most similar perspective to, to, to Dillinger. And, and there was nothing. I mean, a baby could have been on the sidewalk. He'd have knocked the baby out of the way, and, and he'd have gotten right up two or three feet behind Dillinger's head and put that, put that round in his head. So, you know, it seemed, when I looked at it historically, that it became an opportunity for a um, how should I say it, kind of a um, symmetry, a synchronicity of characters intersecting, use the word intersecting, of characters and, and events intersecting in kind of unique ways. And so in, in my work, what I did was I built the end of that intersection, and then I built back all the way to the front of the movie in terms of what, what, what middle do I need for this end to work, and then what should the front be? And that's why I decided on not doing anything linear or biographic about introducing Dillinger, but to find an event like 
the jailbreak in the beginning and to have, hopefully have you know through experiencing him, and many, many of it is subconscious, experiencing what he's doing so that you understand him. You don't even know you understand him, but you understand him. You know what kind of guy he is, you know? So that's the, uh, but it all came from, you know, the, uh, the last couple of scenes, particularly, obviously, clearly, clearly the biograph.